part one of this video series where we're going to be discussing what it takes and methods used to live aboard a small boat. Personally, I have been living on numerous different boats for the past 27 years. This includes small and large sailboats, large multi-hulls, cabin cruisers, trawlers, both home-built and production boats. I have captained all sorts of crafts, modern and antique, from sail to power to steam, and have cruised from Canada all the way down to the tropics. Now, for the sake of this video, we're going to be calling any small boat is going to be between 18 feet and 32 feet. I know people have lived in boats smaller than 18 feet, but to me, I would refer to that as boat camping, and that's a subject for a whole nother series. And I would love to hear your ideas, so please feel free to comment below. I promise to always respond. I'm always looking for a new and better ways to do things. Also, as this will be a series on the subject, please subscribe so you won't miss any of the future videos. Okay, so today on our first video, we're going to discuss the size and type of boat you will need. These obviously differ for the individual by their taste and what they can afford. It also depends on what you plan on using it for. Are you just staying on board as a place to live, or will you be traveling all over with it? And where do you plan on keeping it? A marina, somebody's dock, or at an anchorage? Okay, so let's start with the size. There's two different schools of thought when it comes to small boats. It's either the largest you can afford, or the smallest you feel comfortable living in. Now this is a bit of a misnomer because you can find two of the same size and style of boats with extremely different price ranges. If you use cars, for example, there's a large price difference between a Lexus and a Kia, even though they're both about the same size sedans. Now when you think about the largest you can afford, you have to think about your what you're going to be using it for. For example, staying year round at a free anchorage costs a lot less obviously than constantly traveling. You have to take what it will cost you to use and maintain the boat when calculating the size and type you want. An uh, example of this would be sailboats. They tend to cost more in maintenance than power boats because they have both sails and motor that require maintenance. However, if you're traveling, sails have the opportunity to save you tons on fuel. And now we are just starting to see another option up here, and that's the solar powered boat. This offers unlimited cruising range but this is easily the most expensive option to either purchase or build. I'll do an entire video on that subject later in the series. Most marinas, yacht clubs, etc. charge by the foot or meter, so basically the shorter the boat, the cheaper. Very few charge by the beam or the width of the boat. However, having said that, some will have a surcharge if the boat is exceptionally wide, like some multi-hulls. I lived on a trimaran that was 21 feet wide, and most marinas charged us for two separate slips. Okay, so let's look at the most common basic types of boats. That's sailboats, cabin cruisers or trawlers, with either a planing or displacement hull, houseboats, and hybrids. Without a doubt, traditional houseboats offer the most interior space. However, they do not do well on large bodies of water. They're much better suited to protected harbors and rivers. They also typically require more horsepower to move them around. This type of boat is great, at, great as a floating cabin, but not for long distance cruising. Uh, cabin cruisers with a planing hull are very common, especially here in North America. They're designed for speed and usually have a minimum of accommodations. They're designed to go very fast, not very far. Although being able to outrun a storm can sometimes be a substitute for surviving going through one. For the most part, these are the least desirable for liverboards. Plus, after a day out pounding on the water, your nerves can really get jangled. Displacement cabin cruisers or trawler style boats are the most common type of power liveaboard. They offer the most interior space while still being able to travel on open water. They're not designed to go super fast, but rather have better fuel economy. They also usually have diesel engines, which are more economical to run and require a lot less maintenance. Uh, when deciding between gas and diesel, think of the automobile industry. Ferraris, which are designed to go fast, run on gasoline. And tractor trailers, which are designed to go long distances, run on diesel. Last, we have sailboats. Sailing requires a little bit more know-how than powerboats, but the basics of sailing come pretty easily. And the owners of sailboats have a tendency to be a bit more of the do-it-yourself type. Also, the owners have usually the dreamers who dream of sailing away to far away tropical locations. Although, to be honest, I have met a lot more of them who never sail out of their local waters than those who cross oceans. Overall, sailboats usually have less room to live aboard than powerboats but it's usually arranged in a way to make them more efficient and run more off the grid. Unfortunately, a lot of power boats are set up 
to connect to either shore power or have a large noisy generator to run a lot of their onboard conveniences. I don't mean to imply that power boats can't cruise far. Uh, a good example here in North America, we have what's called the Great Loop. It's a mostly sheltered 6,000 mile route that circles the eastern part of the continent, and it's mostly done by power boats. Now we have to discuss for the two it yourselfers is building your own liveaboard boat. Usually building a boat yourself ends up costing more than just buying a production boat. You might still want to build one because you want that sense of pride saying, I built this, or you can't find one in the market that matches your criteria. Or for some of you who can't get a large sum of money to purchase a boat, you figure you can build one as you can afford it. Now these boats can be absolutely beautiful works of art. Or as I saw in a meme, there's this version where somebody put a camping trailer on top of a raft. Please don't do this. No marina will want you. Personally, I've built numerous boats from dinghies all the way up to 26 feet. Currently, during the summer, I'm staying on an 18-foot hybrid that I had built. I'm now living in a cold climate, and I needed something affordable and simple that would fit in my driveway. To see a video of my little liveaboard boat, I'll put a link to it at the end of this video. Both production boats and do-it-yourself boats are made of a lot of different materials. Most production boats are made of fiberglass, although they do come in steel and aluminum. Typically, aluminum is the most expensive, but because they don't hold paint very well, they become the least attractive option. However, having said that, aluminum has almost no maintenance. It lasts forever. Now, another material is steel. They're very heavy, obviously and they do rust, so they require a lot of maintenance, but they are the strongest without a doubt. And last but not least is fiberglass. Most non-boaters don't realize that fiberglass still requires a lot of maintenance. Fiberglass can blister or delaminate, requires regular paint or gel coat work. Fiberglass requires hauling it out of the water on a regular basis, not only for cleaning, painting, etc., but to do a thorough inspection. Fiberglass is also the most brittle of the materials used. If you hit a rock, most likely you'll have a hole to deal with. Home-built boats are usually made of wood, which requires the most maintenance of all. Although I've seen them made of just about anything, including uh, something called ferro cement, which was a type of cement, which was very popular for a while in the 70s and 80s. Okay, so there are a lot of things to think about when choosing a small liveaboard boat. Not just size and price, but rather size, price, use, and type. Please join us on our next videos when we get into a bit more detailed look at the different parts of living aboard, like anchoring or dinging, plumbing, powering, electrical, children, land transportation, and so on. And please don't forget to subscribe to see the whole series. I'll put a link at the bottom so you can see the whole playlist. Thank you very much.